first question. I think, I think I've gotten all the uh, announcements. Could you please expound on deliverance ministries and Christians possessed by demons? I have done so in a tape entitled Exorcism, Fact or Fiction. And you can listen to that and get an hour and ten minutes of scripture on the subject. However, to answer the question directly, I don't think deliverance ministries per se are mentioned in scripture. I think that the greatest deliverance of all is the preaching of the gospel so that people are born again. I think that there are people God calls to pray for those who are demon-possessed. But I don't like the term deliverance ministries because the task of every Christian minister and every spirit-filled Christian elder to be involved in opposing demonic power. So I don't think that God raises up little cores of people all over the place. I think he does anoint people for specific ministries. But today the deliverance ministry syndrome is all around us. You've got people who are just in deliverance ministries. That's not good. You should be in the ministry of preaching Jesus Christ first, and the deliverance from demons should be something secondary. Remember when the disciples came back to the Lord Jesus and they said to him, uh, the demons are in subjection to us in your name. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, don't rejoice that the demons are in subjection. Rather, rejoice your names have been recorded in heaven. What was the important thing? Deliverance from sin, salvation. That was it. And uh, I'm not opposed to people praying for the demon-possessed. But I have some fears about people who exclusively dedicate themselves to nothing but that. It may well be that God called them, but I would like to see a lot more evidence of it. I feel like I have lost that wonderful overflowing joy I once had, even though I still feel very close to the Lord. I read my Bible and pray. What can I do to regain it? Also, I prayed for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a good step. And perhaps what you need is some good, solid Bible teaching. Perhaps what you need is an examination of your life to find out what things are missing from it that were there when you had First, the joy of God's salvation. There's a lot of things that can get in the way between you and the Lord and rob you of that joy. I can't give an abracadabra explanation for all of it. But I always find that it is involved with the individual's life of devotion, their life of witness, or their interpersonal relationships in their family or in their businesses. Somewhere along the line, we're not doing what we ought to do. I'll give you a clue. Look somewhere in your life and in your past for what the Bible calls the root of bitterness that springs up between brothers and sisters and between families and spiritually defiles. God warns against that. The root of bitterness. I spoke on it one Sunday morning here. I suggest that you pay attention to it. It can very much influence a Christian life. Bitterness against parents. Bitterness against, bitterness against relatives. Against wife. Against husband. Against boss. Somewhere along the line, that bitterness gets into the soul, and it eats like a canker. You have to pray for God to point these things out to you so you can forgive. That's what's important, because you're withholding forgiveness, perhaps, from somebody that needs it. And you're withholding forgiveness on that point, may be withholding God's forgiveness from you on that point. And as a result, you don't have that joy. Well, that's a good way to pursue it. And, of course, to pursue it in the power of the Spirit and the light of God's Word. I am a newly born-again Christian. What's the best way to do battle with my old nature when it tries to sneak in? Could you recommend Scripture? Yes, I can recommend Scripture. Read the seventh chapter of Romans, uh, where Paul had the same problem that you've got. The good that I would do, I do not do. The evil that I would not do, this I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he goes on to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ will. Also, in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it is not I, but Christ who is living in me. So, personal crucifixion must be the constant lot of the Christian. To put to death, says Paul, in the sixth chapter of Romans, read that also. To put to death the desires of the flesh. 
Now, there is only one way that I know to cause your Adamic nature to grow weak. Only one way. Starve it. Starve it. Starve it of the things it wants. Starve it of the lust of the flesh. Starve it of the lust of the eyes. Starve it of the pride of life. Starve it of the works of the flesh. Starve it of everything that you used to practice that you know was contrary to the will of God. Starve it. And it will grow weaker and weaker and weaker and keep feeding the new set of attributes, the new nature God has given you in the Lord Jesus with the Word of God, with communion with the Holy Spirit, with prayer, with attendance at church, with study. Feed the spiritual nature, starve the carnal nature. You do that, it grows weaker. And the Apostle Paul tells you in Colossians chapter 2, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ dwells at the right hand of God. You want to put to death the old nature? Draw close to the Lord Jesus. Be crucified with Him. Not literally, of course, but figuratively. You are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. You are dead to it. Therefore, rise to a newness of life. There are lots of good books on the subject of how to do this. And if you'd like some, why just write us at Christian Research Institute and Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, and we'll be happy to give you some information. Oh, let's see. I don't know what this is, but I'll find out later. <clears throat> Short epistle. In verse 42 of the... One of the criminals, this is Luke 23, 39 to 43, one of the criminals crucified with Jesus asked, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. But John 20, 17, Jesus told Mary not to hold on to him because he had not yet ascended to his father. It was three days after the statement made in Luke 23, 43. What paradise did Jesus speak of that he and the criminal would be in on that day? Answer, when Mary went to take hold of him, Jesus didn't say, don't touch me. He said, don't detain me. Don't detain me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. To ascend refers to a physical form. Jesus had not entered heaven with his physical form. That is why he said, don't stop me. But he had entered paradise. He had freed David, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of those who were waiting in the place of departed spirits for the coming of Messiah. He had proclaimed across the great gulf that separates it from hell that God had kept his word, that the scriptures were indeed true, that Messiah was here, and that deliverance was at hand for those who had believed him. God vindicated his word. Now, three days afterwards, he ascended to the Father in his own body, so well, that is the difference. Now, if you'd like a good commentary on this subject, I would suggest you check uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, which has a good uh, discussion of this, and also Lenski's commentary uh, in the New Testament on Second uh, Peter, and I think you'll find it dealt with also there. Do you feel in the Christian life there ever is a time when abortion is considered permissible by God? Uh... Let's see. Don't read this to the class. Okay, I won't read that to the class. Sort of circumscribes my answer somewhat. I have a cassette on the subject of abortion entitled, Abortion Is It Always Murder? I don't believe abortion is always murder. I don't believe it's murder in the case of incest. I don't believe it's murder in the case of forcible rape. I don't believe it's murder if tissue is excised from a child when the child is incapable of supporting, bearing, or sustaining it through some fault of sexual relations at a very early age. And I believe that abortion is murder when it is used as a means of birth control or getting rid of an unwanted baby on the part of adults. I think then you are dealing directly with premeditated murder. But there are people who say that abortion is always 
wrong, and always murder. I would have to take strong exception to that because these same people say that it's perfectly all right to do it in the case of incest and rape. Therefore, I think that they have somewhat of a logical problem. Now, there are still others who say, incest and rape be hanged. Have the baby. And my response to that is, the God who demanded the death of the rapist can hardly logically demand the fruit of the rapist from the womb of the person that was violated. Think that one through sometime. The principle of the character of the God of the Bible is such that do you wish to place him in the position, since he hasn't spoken on the subject, would you like to place him in the position of saying that a 12-year-old child just past puberty who gets dragged into an alley in Chicago and raped and finds herself pregnant is to bear the fruit of that violent, evil rapist? I don't see where this is consistent with biblical theology one bit. So we do have our problems. I have a cassette on the subject which has already triggered enormous controversy. And I'm happy to say there's nobody, nobody in the middle on the controversy. They're either, or, one of the two. So that's nice to have it either way, because you know that you won't float down the river of flowery ease. My husband and his parents play cards together. Also, they play cards with close friends. Sometimes they use pennies or nickels, or other times they use no money but points. I believe that card playing with or without money is wrong. Could you give a scriptural basis for this? No. <laughs> One that could cover both instances? No. All I can tell you is this. That... If you are practicing something in your life, even if it's eating meat in the presence of a vegetarian, that causes the vegetarian to become weak in his faith and to fall in his spiritual walk, you are not to eat the meat in the presence of the vegetarian. Romans chapter 14. We will transpose that to virtually any practice, including card playing. If it causes a brother or a sister to fall, you should not practice it. And what you should do, as these people are Christians, is to go to them and say, I am a weaker brother. You are offending me by playing cards for money or without it. As a Christian, I wish you wouldn't do that. And if they are good, sensible Christians, they will abstain from that practice, at least in your presence, which is all you care about. Now, as far as gambling is concerned, I've already answered that question on many occasions, and the answer is still the same. God tells us that we are on this earth to serve Him, that everything we have belongs to Him, and that we have no right risking His property. You're born again. Everything you have belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have no business fooling around with God's money. It belongs to Him. So if you're going to go to Vegas and say, I'm going to spend $50 on the slot machines now, and that's not a sin, you're wrong. Because God gave you the $50, and He gave you the strength to earn it, and you could just as easily give the $50 to missions or to some other cause that's going to bring people to Jesus Christ rather than supporting the Mafia. Who runs Vegas? The underground empire of evil, whom the Lord Jesus will utterly ruin and destroy with the brightness of His coming. Our government hasn't got the guts to do it, but the kingdom of heaven will take care of it once and for all. Have you heard or have you read any books by Arthur E. Bloomfield, The Last Days Before Armageddon? No, I have not. You mentioned at ten television that you didn't believe that the devil could know what we are thinking. Do you have some scriptural reference for that? Sure. John chapter 14. Jesus said the ruler of this age was coming, Satan, who was in Judas Iscariot. And he said, I will not talk with you much anymore. Well, why didn't he go on talking with them? If Satan could read the mind, it wouldn't make any difference. But you learn from that that Satan does not have access to the mind. Therefore, most of his information he gets from our big mouths. 
Ah, the only time he can't eavesdrop is when you're praying because you're addressing the Lord and you ask the Lord to protect you so that you may talk only with him. But if we didn't talk so much about what we intended to do, the devil wouldn't have near as much information as he has. Now, a line in Scripture says he can read your mind, but I'm sure he eavesdrops on our spirits every chance that he can. Our faithful ushers have arrived and are rushing down the aisle. Rushing down the aisle. Good thinking, brothers. Our Bible class is supported by your prayers and your presence. It's our way of telling Melody Lamb we believe in a Bible teaching ministry. As the Lord has prospered you, we ask you to give. Hilariously, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. You can't give it cheerfully. Keep it. Won't do you any good anyhow. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask you to sanctify these gifts by the word of God and this prayer and multiply them to the advancement of the kingdom of thy Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We will continue with our question period. You can speed read, says the ad. Everyone should learn to speed read. I strongly recommend this course. Walter Martin. Oh, I said that? I said that. Yes, I did. Just kidding, Jim. <laughs> you understand, I do advocate speed reading. It's tremendously interesting. Can evil spirits possess animals? There are records of animals being used by demons. And we find this frequently in the Old Testament where familiar spirits uh, were connected with animals, also with ancient religious traditions other than Christianity. Uh, cats particularly were noted for this particular thing. And that's why the cat goddess Bast was very, very powerful in Egypt because demonic manifestations came through the priests, uh, women priests of the temple of Bast, and uh, they usually had cats, and the cats were referred to as the residual of their familiars or of their demonic controls or spirits. This uh, has been a part of history. Yes, indeed. Uh, I forgot to answer one part of a question before about demon possession for Christians. May I be perfectly transparent on this? There is not one single line, hint, or suggestion in all Holy Scripture that anyone who is the temple of the Holy Spirit can at the same time be the temple of demons. Nothing whatsoever. Now, I think that's a very important point because people have come out of the woodwork all over the place in the last few years since the occult explosion, 1965, 66, and they have been writing books and uh, doing cassettes, and running to and fro, creating almost psychotic Christians. Everything that happens, they say, virtually, is the result of some demon. It's a demon of alcohol, a demon of drugs, a demon of this, a demon of that. There are demons in everything. They even tell you to bring along your barf bags when you come to their meetings so you can vomit up the demons. Now, that's a lot of infernal nonsense. And it is. 1 John chapter 4 tells you what? You have overcome them, little children. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, if you're demon-possessed and a Christian, you have been overcome. The Scripture is wrong. The temple of the Holy Spirit is the temple of demons at the same time, and you have destroyed any security the Christian has as the temple of God. The Bible, on the other hand, repudiates this. And if you're God's property, you're not the devil's. If you have Christ's spirit, you don't have any other spirit. So please don't get into this hang-up or this bag. The people who are running around who are saying, Christians have demons, always base it on experience. They never base it on Scripture. Never. You have something on that? Oh, I have never denied the fact that we can be harassed, afflicted, zapped. Pick your adjective. I don't really care, or your verb. The fact still remains we are subject to attack by demonic power. But attack is completely different from demonization, which is total control. Okay? Pardon? 
Certainly, sin alters people's behavior all the time without demons involved at all. Am I right? Something happens to us when we fall into sin and we walk away from God. When you turn away from the light, there's only one place for you to go, into the darkness. When that happens, suddenly you don't want to talk to your old friends who are believers. Suddenly you don't want to go to church because there's a lot of hypocrites there. And suddenly you don't want to read the Scripture because you've been through that before. And it all reads the same. And all the excuses start coming up. Yeah, sound familiar? You bet it is. Every person that yields to their carnal nature gets into that bag one way or another. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we know that these things are bugging us, then we know that our carnal natures are at work. Don't blame everything on the demons. Remember, if the devil were imprisoned today for a thousand years, as one day he will, there's enough residual evil left in the world to manifest itself in sin all over this earth. And during the millennial kingdom, there will be sin. With Christ reigning here and the church reigning here, there will be, during the millennium, rebellion against God that will be put down. So obviously, if Satan is bound during that period and people live in perfect conditions, that doesn't eliminate the nature of man. God's going to have to deal with that finally. Let's see. What happened to people who were born before Christ or primitive people in America who lived without the word of Christ for thousands of years? How are they judged? The Bible tells you that in Romans chapters 1 and 2. The invisible things of God from the creation of the universe are clearly seen. They are testified to by the things which have been created even his eternal power and divinity, so man stands without excuse. For when they knew God, doesn't that tell you something? All the primitive nations have at one time or another known him. Oh, we find his fingerprints and his footprints all over their culture and their religion. But when they knew him as God, they did not glorify him as God, but their empty hearts and their imaginations became empty. And they transformed the glory of the immortal God into corruptible things. They exchanged incorruptibility for corruptibility and became the worshippers of idols and themselves. So they knew him. Secondly, the Bible says that God has given enough evidence to the pagans of the world that they may seek after him, feel for him, and find him. He is not far from any one of us. Acts chapter 17. In him we live and move and have our being. Donald Barnhouse put it this way. He said, if some headhunter in the Amazon looks into the reflection in the water one morning and sees his face and sees the trees above him and the sun and says, I know I couldn't have made me. I know I couldn't have made the water. I know I couldn't have made the trees or the, the sun. I know I couldn't have done any of these things. There must be somebody bigger than me. And then that headhunter cries out, Oh, whoever you are, wherever you are, who made everything that there is, help! He is fulfilling Acts chapter 17. He is reaching out for God. And the scripture says, We will find him. He is not far from any one of us. Abraham said, Shall not the judge of the whole earth do what is right? Yes. Then why don't you leave the pagans that you can't get to, to the justice of the God who is perfectly just? And why don't you worry about the pagans next door and down the block and across the street who are going to hell because you aren't opening your mouth? The devil always gets us fixed on some foreign land. And getting gets us to asking questions about what's going to happen to the Aborigines? What's going to happen to the Zulus? What's going to happen to the Ubangis? What's going to happen, says God, you dummy, to the guy next door? Isn't that right? Always somewhere else, never here. Now, right next door to me, a family of Baha'is has moved in. They have invited me to their Bible study. And I'm going.
And we're going to talk about the Bab, we're going to talk about Abdul Baha and Baha'u'llah. We're going to talk about all these things. I'm going to be an innocent, wide-eyed stranger in paradise. And then we're going to get to Jesus, and then the fat's going to hit the fire. So I'm letting him get settled so they'll be reasonably comfortable and they won't move out too quickly. And then I'm going to take a couple of Christian friends of mine. We're going to go there and love them to death. But that's next door. You see what I mean? In the local church, if the local church errs in regard to the Trinity, does this mean they are unsaved? If not, please explain. In our new pamphlet on the subject of the teachings of Witness Lee in the local church, also in a tract on the subject and a cassette, I've explained this in detail. I'm not going to go into it again. All I'll do is tell you this. It's possible to be ignorant of the doctrine of the Trinity and be saved. It is not possible to deny and to attack the Christian doctrine of the Trinity and be saved. I don't believe the local church attacks it. I just think they're in monumental ignorance because of the fact that Witness Lee doesn't understand historic Christian theology or biblical theology. And the men around him who do are heretical. And they are telling this man things that are not true. And since he doesn't know Greek and he doesn't know Hebrew and he doesn't know church history and he doesn't know heresy, it's easy for him to go along with it, and I think he has. We should pray for Brother Lee. We should pray for the people in the local church because they are dividing the body of Christ. And while we're praying for them, remember Romans 16, 17. Mark out those among you who cause divisions and have nothing to do with them. Obviously, until they repent. So we love them and pray for them. But watch yourself. Because the doctrine, in a number of places, is very definitely corrupt. Is it true that the consensus of biblical scholars reject the authorship of Peter in the first epistle of Peter? No, it is not true. The consensus of liberal scholars have rejected it. But then the liberals reject virtually everything anyhow. So why should they stop with Peter's first epistle? It was accepted by the church at the Council of Carthage and long before that. And there's nothing in it contrary to Scripture. I would rather take that judgment than the liberal scholars with 1,900 years of hindsight who looks back and says he didn't do it. Well, that's interesting. Since they weren't there, one would like to know how they are so sure of it. The answer is, if you don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, why should you believe in the authorship of Peter? And liberal scholars are notorious for that error. Our company gave us complimentary tickets to see the movie Beyond and Back, saying that because one of the officials was such a believer in reincarnation that he was encouraging the movie. We haven't seen it yet, what do you feel that he got from the movie to feel this way about it? I have not seen the movie Beyond and Back. I have only heard a tape of two sections of it, one on reincarnation, the other on a seance. I consider it to be abominable and theologically yuck. All right? I'm happy to say that I joined Pastor Wilkerson in that. He feels exactly the same way and disclaimed the movie's presentation of the book in the main auditorium, and three services to point out that they had used the book as a basis and departed therefrom. And he did not retain supervisory right over the script. Had he done so, he could have stopped those two things. But I understand there's a good deal of gospel material in the film Beyond and Back, for which I rejoice. I'm just terribly sorry that the reincarnation bugs and the uh, seance spiritists got into segments of it. They don't belong there, and Pastor Wilkerson is the first to say so. I agree with him. One thing I like about Ralph Wilkerson, he doesn't try and whitewash things when they're out in the open and you have to face up to them. And I admire a man who will say, yes, it's the title of my book. Yes, they use it as a basis for the movie. No, I don't agree with these things, and state so. I would do exactly the same thing. That was his judgment, and I thank God that he... Uh, has taken that kind of a stand in it. Now, nobody's perfect. We're all sinners saved by grace, and Pastor Wilkerson will be the first to admit that he's right up there with everybody else, but he is not responsible for what they did to beyond and back. 
See what Hollywood does every time it gets its hands on spiritual truth. It just can't resist mucking it up. Who is going to side with Satan in the last rebellion? His followers, demons and men. Is it the children that will be born in the millennial kingdom? Yes, and some of the people that come out of the millennial kingdom. And a thousand years on a perfect earth, you can reproduce like rabbits. Right? A thousand years, the child shall die at a hundred years. That would be a Mormon paradise. The Mormons are always teaching eternal sex with multiple partners. The millennium is a thousand years of that. Would you recommend, no, no polygamy in the millennium, excuse me. Would you recommend a one volume Bible? Somebody's going to go out of here and say, Martin said there's polygamy in the millennium. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Got enough trouble with one wife now. Not me, people in general. <laughs> My wife isn't here this morning. It's a reasonably safe statement to make. Would you recommend a one-volume Bible commentary that pretty much holds your position, especially post-tribulation in position? There isn't any one volume uh, that uh, holds all the opinions that I have because, because most of my theology uh, is eclectic. That is, I don't really care if it's an Episcopalian, a Roman Catholic, a Methodist, a Baptist, a Seventh-day Adventist, whatever they may be. If they've got the best slant on a particular passage in context, I will endorse it if it will hold up as far as the whole tenor of Scripture is concerned. Therefore, I draw from a vast array. I probably have 40 commentaries from different sources. And I'm happy to say on the basic doctrines of the faith, we don't have any disagreement, whatever. But there are differences in shades of opinion on baptism and the Lord's Supper and the tribulations and millennium and all the rest of those things. People get pretty uptight on that subject. And they really shouldn't. Because it's peripheral theology. The centrality of the message is Christ. Let's stop fighting about all of the periphery. Never really produces anything anyhow but strife. Uh, if you want recommendations of good Bible commentaries that I would uh, urge you to have, uh, just write us at Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, and we will be happy to give you that information. After listening to your message again this morning on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and hearing of the miracles of the five-year-old boy, we covet your, your prayer for my nephew and so forth. She gave birth to... I can't read this. I'm awfully sorry, but your handwriting somewhat resembles mine. Uh, let me check it afterwards, and uh, then I will try and find out what you are saying. But I can't read it right now. Um... Good morning. Could you give me some verses to quote when someone is dying, like 1 John 4.4, 4, to rebuke Satan? When somebody is dying, what you want to do is get through in the last conscious moments with one great unalterable fact. This is the end of the line, and this is the bottom line, and one just can't waste any time. You've got to say to that person, listen. Jesus Christ loved you and died on Calvary for your sins. Remember the thief on the cross. It's not too late. Turn to Christ. Now, that's direct and blunt. But when a house is on fire, you don't politely knock on the door. If you have any brains, you kick in the windows, knock down the door, and drag the people out onto the porch. They may kick, bite, scratch, and curse all the way. But when they get out on the porch, are they going to love you? Because they're alive. That's the same thing that we're into with a person who's dying. Dr. Barnhouse once told me that he talked to a Christian science lady who didn't believe in disease, suffering, or death, and she was dying of cancer in a hospital. Barnhouse went in and spoke to her, and he perceived immediately that she was dying. And uh, he sat down, and I thought, well, now he's going to use the tender pastoral care approach. Oh, no. Dr. Barnhouse said to her, Jenny... This is Dr. Barnhouse. And she said, Ah, oh, oui, monsieur le docteur. She was French. Well, he spoke French fluently. So he spoke French to her for 30 minutes. And this is what he said to her. Jenny, Mrs. Eddy has lied to you. She said there is no disease, suffering, or death. You are diseased, you are suffering, and you are going to die. And the woman virtually leapt out of the bed. <laughs> she sat 
almost straight up. And she said, Whoa! And he said, Now I have the best news for you you have ever heard. And he preached Jesus Christ for 25 minutes. And at the end of that time, she bowed her head and received the Lord Jesus as her Savior. I had her funeral. And I used the funeral to preach to all her Christian science friends. I mean, there was the body in the box. And all these people there smiling because there, there was no disease, there was no suffering, there was no death, you know. I said, will you look over there, please? And everybody looked. The smiles faded. And I said, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said, the living know they must die. You and I are going to die if Jesus Christ does not come back again. You are diseased. You are aging. You have eyeglasses. You have false teeth. You have braces on your back. You smear your face with hormone cream and you do exercises and eat your food, but you are dying! Whole place deflated in a fraction of a second. I said, but the best news in the world is what Jenny Briol found out. Jesus Christ is alive. Son of God, Savior, He shed His blood for your sins. My, what a jolly time we had. <laughs> Thirty minutes of the love of God and the judgment of God. I had people come up to me after that meeting. Some of them were celebrities who had come because she was the mother of a celebrity. One of them was Gary Moore, the television entertainer. And he came to me quietly in the cloakroom afterwards and took my hand. We were friends from before that. And looked up at me with tears flowing in his eyes. And he said, Walter, he said, it's been a long time since I was in that Methodist church in Baltimore where I heard the gospel as a boy. He said, today wasn't a funeral for me. Today was back to church. And then he said, you know, after what you said, maybe there is some hope for Gary Moore. And I said, there is! And I gave him a good shot for five minutes. <laughs> Never pass up an opportunity if you get a chance. Never get near that person again. Just the other day, I was having lunch over here at the Grand Hotel. And while I'm sitting there eating, I look up and one of my favorite comedians comes in. I've admired this man for years. Clean, decent, hilarious humor. Red Skelton. Yeah. And he came in, sat down with two young ladies. And I thought to myself, I wonder how I can talk to him. <laughs> and so I sat there eating my meal. The whole time I was there, I was watching him out of the corner of my eye. I was trying to think of some way to get to him. And it dawned on me how. After I finished, he was finishing his meal up. I threw a couple of tracks and walked over to his table. I said, Mr. Skelton. He said, yes, I don't want to interfere with your meal. No, no, that's perfectly all right. I said, I'm Professor Martin from across the street at Melody Land. So, delighted to meet you. We shook hands. This is my uh, daughter and this is uh, uh, my granddaughter. I said, fine, delighted to meet you. I said, you know, you and I go back a long way. He said, we do. I said, yes, we go back to 1938 to the Red Skelton Hour on CBS. He said, no. I said, yes, we go back to Clem Gadiddle Hopper and Willie Lump Lump and Ozzie and Harriet. He said, yeah. And I, said, and I started reciting his movies and all the things that I had seen. He just sat there, ah, oh, yeah, mm-hmm, ah, yeah. Well, you know, I had ten minutes with him. We had instant rapport. Then I got to talking about it, clean humor, and I got to the gospel. I said, you know, I'd like you to take this and like you to read this. I said, the Lord has something for you here. So he took it and looked at it. He said, I'll do that. I'll take it. I will read it. He said, and you're very, very kind, very gracious to take the time and stop. I said, not at all. Your continuing presence is my autograph. I'm not even going to ask you for one. You've lighted my life so many times. He said, well, thank you. He was almost in tears. I said, and read that, too. He said, I will. I will. He shook hands with me. <laughs> now, Red Skelton is the soul for whom Jesus Christ died. 
What are you going to do? Let him go to hell because he's a multimillionaire comedian and nobody wants to go near him? Of course not. Somebody has to go. It could be you. So you don't pass up those kind of opportunities God gives you. I think we are moving toward the time when I must close a question and answer period. But uh, let me get rid of these. What track do I use? I handed them a Campus Crusade track that I had, uh, which I thought was very good. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And then I gave him something else. And I forget the track that I gave him at the moment, but it was not Ten Reasons Why I Swear, I can tell you that. <laughs> I want to expand on something I spoke on earlier, because something in the newspaper arrested my attention, and I think that it has great spiritual application for us. Romans, chapter 11. Beginning at verse 25, concerning Israel. I would not, brothers, that you would be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. In part. You notice that? They still are worshipers of the living God, but they are blind to his Messiah. And this partial blindness has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel will be redeemed. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I will take away their sins. Now Israel is going to be redeemed. That is obviously those in Israel who will repent of their sins. For God says, my covenant with them will be honored when I shall take away their sins. And he will take away the sin of the Jew upon the repentance of the Jew and the recognition of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we are told will take place on a larger scale and increase even more so as we accelerate toward the consummation of the ages. You notice in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, Paul addresses himself to this subject. I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. Perish the thought. I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now listen. This whole chapter is a reminder to the church of Jesus Christ that God has a place for the Jew. That the covenant he made with Abraham will be fulfilled. That we are spiritual Jews, as they will become spiritual Jews. Now they are Jews only after the flesh. You know it's surprising how many people don't realize this important truth. I was coming out of the Grand Hotel right after talking with Red Skelton, and a man was walking beside me who had heard me talking to one of my associates, and a total stranger, and he said to me, you know, he said, you act, you talk, he said, uh, like, um, like someone that could go before a TV camera or go on a microphone. He said, I don't know who you are, he said, but I'm in the recording business. And he said, I'd be interested in talking with you. I said, I'm already in it. So I can't talk with you about that, but give me your card anyhow. So he gave it to me. We chatted going out there, and I said, are you born again? Just out of the blue, you know, no introduction, nothing. Just, are you born again? And he said, if you could tell me what it was, I could tell you. I said, if I need to tell you what it was, you're not. He said, oh. I said, but you can be. You're a Jew. He said, that's right. I'm a spiritual Jew. Oh, yeah. And then I took five minutes right outside under the portico of the Grand Hotel 
to tell this man all about how he could go on being a physical Jew and for the first time become a spiritual Jew. Now I'm going to correspond with him. And he was in shock. He said, we're hurting you like this before. I said, you've heard nothing yet. I said, Jesus is the Messiah, and I gave him the gospel. What's interesting is, he didn't understand that he would go right on being a Jew till the day he died. He thought, when he converted to Christianity, he stopped being a Jew. I said, no, you start being one, spiritual and physical. This is something we've got to spread out for the world to see. God has not forsaken the Jew. We cannot turn our back upon them. Right now the United States is flirting with divine judgment and we don't even know it. We are fooling around with the petrodollars. We are worrying about the Arabs. Anwar Sadat has put on the robes of Messiah and flies from capital to capital telling everybody he wants peace. Well, before we get suckered into it, let's learn something. Mr. Sadat wants peace at the price of the Jews giving him back what belongs to them. It is not Egypt's land. It is not Syria's land. It is not the land of the Arab. If they had been there for 10,000 years, it is the land of the Jew by divine covenant. And God said, I give it to you and to your seed forever. That is why America, were she wise, would fight for Israel tomorrow morning. Because it is the land of God's promise. And we are bound there by the record of Holy Scripture, which says all the nations of the world will one day revolve around the land of God, as spokes do around the hub of a wheel. And we are seeing that happening right now as more and more attention is focused in that area. President Carter must be prayed for vigorously and upheld in prayer. He is a brother. He needs the illumination and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and courage and strength because he's going to need every bit of it that he's got. He must make hard decisions. We've got to pray that he is not influenced into doing anything that would jeopardize our relationship with the Jew. Because who touches Israel, even in her apostasy, touches the pupil of Yahweh's eye. That is very sensitive, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God help us if we ever get to that place. But this whole chapter is talking about God's love, God's promise, God's restoration for the Jew. So I was very interested to open the Los Angeles Herald Examiner and see this article. I'd like to share it with you. Jewish scholars reclaim Jesus. The reappraisal of Jesus' place in history does not alter Judaism's basic denial of the Christian doctrine that Jesus was the Messiah. Scholars generally argue that Jesus did not believe he was founding a new religion. That's the ground rules. We are not saying Jesus is the Messiah, and we are not agreeing with basic Christian theology, but we would like to go back, step one, and reconsider the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, this is coming right out of Israel. It's not coming out of New York City or America or any other part of the world. It's coming out of Israel. What's going on in Israel? Well, listen for yourself. After centuries of relative silence by Jews on the subject of Jesus, including periods when the mention of the name was rarely or was rare or even forbidden, some Jewish scholars have recently stepped up efforts to reclaim the first century figure as an exemplary, deeply religious Jew deserving of a high place in Jewish history. The reappraisal does not alter Judaism's basic denial of the Christian doctrine that Jesus was the Messiah. Rather, the focus is upon presenting a positive image of Jesus as an observant Jew who had strong nationalistic feelings and a powerful moral message rooted in the Hebrew Scriptures, and whose role was misinterpreted by Christians. 
Most of this reassessment is taking place in Israel, where a majority Jewish population provides more than favorable conditions for a relaxed discussion of the sensitive subject that in societies where, Jesus, where Jewish minorities are inclined toward a more cautious attitude. But the revisionist view of Israeli scholars are gaining attention. This is, this is utterly fascinating. In the United States, largely through books, journals, and evidence of a similar movement can be found in this country in Jewish academic and religious life. An example of emerging perspective is found in an article in the current issue of the Journal of Ecumenical Studies, published by Temple University in Philadelphia, written by the Israeli religious scholar Dr. Pincus Lapide. Quote, We Jews are very proud of our Einsteins, Heinrich Heines, and Sigmund Freuds, Lapide says. We ought to be much prouder of Jesus. Jesus was as faithful to the law as I would ever hope to be. I even suspect that Jesus was more faithful to the law than I am, and I'm an Orthodox Jew. Lapita teaches at Bar Ilion University in Tel Aviv, has been among the most active proponents of a revised view of Jesus. Among his contributions is a book that analyzes 29 recent Jewish books on Jesus and finds a very positive attitude toward the religious leader in all of them. Lapida likewise studied Israeli elementary and secondary textbooks. This is important. And found an increasing amount of material about Jesus and Christianity. The references stress the identity of Jesus as a Jew with a strong sense of religious mission. Religious commentators in modern times have noted with increasing irony the reluctance of both Christians and Jews through the ages to accept the Jewish background of Jesus. Among Jews, this trait was part of general inattention toward a religious figure who by the standards of Judaism has been unjustifiably transformed by Christians into a divine person. Jews often associate the same figure with crimes against them at the hands of Christians. I was talking to a professor at the university in Jerusalem who teaches a course on Christianity for the Jews, for the rabbinical students at that university. And he was telling me that Jewish scholars are hostile to liberal Christians. They're hostile to liberalism. I said, why? He said, because liberalism keeps saying that Jesus didn't claim to be Messiah, that is, God in human flesh. He said, I read the New Testament regularly. I have to study the New Testament, and I've become familiar with it as a means of teaching it in my courses. He said, if there is one thing that emerges from the pages of the New Testament, it's the fact that Jesus thought he was the Son of God and that he was divine. He said, I don't happen to believe that, but it's there nevertheless. And then he said, you know, it just isn't honest for somebody to call themselves a Christian and a follower of Jesus and deny what Jesus said about himself. That came out of an Orthodox Jew teaching a course on Christianity in Jerusalem. Finally, one other point of great importance. You have no idea how significant this is. It means that at the core of Orthodox Judaism today, they are beginning to think through the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The Scripture says, If you search for me, you will find me, if you seek for me with all your heart. One professor in the University of Jerusalem told a friend of mine who studies there, Quote, Jesus is my rabbi. Jesus is my teacher. Jesus is the supreme rabbi. And my friend said, well, was he Messiah? And this rabbinical scholar paused, looked into the eyes of my friend and said, I don't know. I don't know if he was or not. But he said, in all history, there has been no more likely Jewish candidate.
<laughs> I said, that's very interesting. My friend almost choked. Because here is this venerable Hebrew scholar. Jesus is my rabbi, my teacher. I was told by one professor there that it's not unusual to have young rabbinical students leap to their feet and defend the interpretations of the Torah by Jesus of Nazareth against the commentators, maintaining that he was the most orthodox of the orthodox and that therefore he should not in any way be considered heretical as a Jew. Fascinating. Do you know when you mention the name of Jesus to an orthodox Jew a hundred years ago? <laughs> That's right. Spit and blaspheme. But now, they listen. They listen. Because they are beginning to listen to the echoes of the centuries. They're beginning to listen to history. They're beginning to find out that the Christian, the true Christian, loves the Jew. And the true Christian protects and prays for the Jew. The pseudo-Christian will betray him and murder him, but the genuine Christian will die for him and with him. That's something they're beginning to learn, which is a great, great movement forward. Conclusion. Confusion has also resulted from the perception of Jesus as a Christian. You know, there's a lot of people think that. Jesus was the first Christian. No, he wasn't. Christianity came into existence only after the death of Jesus and through the work of his disciples, that is, the proclamation of his church. Scholars generally agree that Jesus did not believe he was founding a new religion. That's interesting. When Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's amazing how the Bible sheds so much light on the scholars. Christians, on the other hand, have frequently de-emphasized the Jewishness of Jesus as a means of disassociating the church from the majority of Jews who do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Interestingly enough, 1922, a book was published, Jesus of Nazareth by Joseph Klausner, a respected Jewish scholar. The following year, Rabbi Stephen Wise, the influential Reformed Jewish leader, preached on, quote, Jesus the Jew, close quote emphasizing the identification of Jesus of Nazareth with Judaism. It was the first time a rabbi and prominent Zionist had broached the subject from the pulpit and it unleashed a storm of protest. Other Jewish theologians and philosophers have followed. Leo Beck, the German theologian, Martin Buber, Jules Isaac, the French Jewish historian, whose book Jesus and Israel, published in 1968, had a considerable impact upon Judaism. From youth on, Dr. Buber wrote, I felt Jesus to be my elder brother. Jesus deserves a large place in Judaism, Buber continued, and this place can be described by none of the customary categories. What did Buber mean? Jesus deserves a large place. Translation, what category do you put him in? Prophet? Bigger than that. Priest? No. What's left? King of kings and Lord of lords. Buber never said that. But he said you run out of categories when you talk about Jesus Christ. When the walls of separation came down, said Michael Pregi, the Israeli Counselor General Advisor on Church Relations in North America, thousands of Jews had their first encounter with Christians. They knew almost nothing about Christianity. When the walls came down, what was that, 1967, in the last ten and a half years, the Jews have discovered us as allies, not enemies. They have discovered the church, and they have rediscovered and are attempting to reclaim Jesus of Nazareth. The marvelous part about it all is they don't yet realize that it is Jesus of Nazareth, Christ of God, who is going to reclaim them by the blood of the cross. And that's why I wanted to fit this article into this context, because Christians must take heart. Listen. Romans, chapter 11, verse 28. Concerning the gospel, the Jews are enemies for your sake. They fight the gospel. 
but as touching the election and the choice of God. They are beloved for the sake of their fathers. Look at verse 29. Oh, what joy radiates from that text. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, says the Greek. They can never be rescinded. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What purpose serves the law? To point us to the Messiah. What purpose Messiah? To redeem us from the curse of the law. What purpose the church? To carry the good news of the kingdom of heaven to the ends of the earth. To the Jew chronologically first. And then also to the Gentiles. Yes, they are opposed to Christianity. We hear that right here. Yes, they're opposed to Christ as Messiah. Yes, they are unregenerate. Enemies of the truth where we're concerned. But the scripture says, be loved by God himself because of the faith of their fathers. And I want to tell you something. Before we get too high and mighty about the Jew and how they've fallen from such heights of grace, we had jolly well better remember something. Had they not fallen, we would not have arisen. Had they not rejected, we would not have opportunity to receive. And we are the children of Abraham by faith. They are the children of Abraham by generation. We are both the children of Abraham, Jew and Gentile, when we receive Jesus Christ, God's Messiah and Savior. To him give all the prophets witness that whoever believes in him shall receive the forgiveness of sin. Exciting things are happening. In Israel, God is breathing. There is inquisitiveness. There is desire. There is hunger. There is thirst. I never forget not wanting to visit Mount Sinai the time before last when I went to Israel with Mike Ephes. Mike was going to Sinai because I figured he should go to Sinai. After all, he got the law. So it shouldn't be a total loss. He should go. But we were at Elat, right on the Red Sea, and Betty S. has got sick, and the temperature at Sinai was very high, and the altitude, and Michael's heart was not what it should be, so I was elected, and I went. They had a marvelous time. Wonderful. But to get to Sinai, to the monastery, on the area where Moses is supposed to have received the law, we had to travel over a road that I can only describe as primitive camelback. I want to tell you, no kidneys on earth can survive that road. I don't care who they are. My left kidney twitched for two weeks after I got home. Every time I saw a bump in the road. I mean, it was an incredible washboard. They've done something about it since then, but it's, it was murder. And riding up front, bouncing up and down, I'm sitting next to a young Israeli soldier who is our guide and a student at the University of Jerusalem. And I'm saying to myself in between jars, how am I going to get him to talk about Jesus? And all of a sudden it dawned on me. Oh, why didn't I think of that before? I struck up a conversation on archaeology. And he said, yes, he had done archaeological digs. He was very interested in archaeology. I said, isn't it significant how archaeology confirms the authority of Holy Scripture? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, haven't you studied some of the digs which confirm the authority of Scripture, that it was very accurate, that God said this? He said, well, yes, there are some points. I said, have you ever analyzed the prophetic utterances of the Scriptures? He said, uh, well, uh, some of them. I said, did you ever consider the one that talks about Messiah? He said, oh, Isaiah 53. I said, no. No. I said, no. Daniel chapter 9. He said, what's that got to do with it? I said, don't you know about the elephantine papyri? He said, no. I said, don't you know what they found in Egypt? No. I said, oh, well, I said, we'll talk about it sometime. Talk about it now. <laughs> he was hooked for 35 minutes. And I laid out for him how 
two Seventh-day Adventist archaeologists had dug up through their studies and through the work of other archaeologists the evidence that supports the ninth chapter of Daniel that dates for us the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And Daniel said from the decree to build Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah was 490 years. And he said, they found the date? I said, of course. The Jews in Egypt recorded it on elephantine papyri. And they marked the date of the ascension of the king who sent the decree out. And we now know it has been verified by Johns Hopkins University's professor, William F. Albright, a liberal. He said, what's the date? I said, 457 spring B.C. They signed the decree that spring. He said, really? Is it documented? I said, let me give you the references. He wrote them down. And I said, now start counting. 490 years. 483 to the coming of Messiah. And he counted. 27 A.D. And he looked at me and I said, Sound familiar? <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth began to preach. And for three and a half years his ministry went forth. And his eyes just sparkled for a moment. I never heard of that before. I said, well, I'm a Christian. Jesus is my Messiah. He's yours, too. And boy, did he ever get it for the next 10 or 15 minutes. You know, that young fellow stuck with me like glue. He said to me, sir, would you come and lecture in my course at the university if I can arrange it? I said, certainly. He said, I'd never heard this before. I said, you can hear a lot more. He was wounded for our transgression. Who? Israel. And he began to listen. Gospel. Well, I thought I'd gotten across to him, and that was good. Praise the Lord. He never left me. And when I got to the bush that they talk about as being the burning bush, which I don't believe it is, I thought, what a great opportunity. There he was standing there. So I opened up Exodus chapter 3, and I preached, eh, eh, yeah, ha, yeah, Aisha, eh, yeah. And he turned around like that and looked at me. I said, I am that I am. This is my name forever, my memorial to all generations. Yahweh Elohim. And then I preached Jesus Christ in John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, eh, <laughs> yeah. He never moved. Just stood there with his Bible open, looking at me up and down and up and down like this. <laughs> you know, he got in my ear on the bus going back and never stopped talking the whole way back. What was he talking about? Questions, questions, questions. How did I know? How could you explain? What about this? What about that? But I tell you, from one end of the Sinai to the other, it was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They're looking over their shoulders. They're thinking. And they're beginning to hear. Let's not forget what the Scripture says. The gifts and the call of God to the Jew have never been revoked. He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. We have the priceless privilege of being, in the words of Moish Rosen, Jews for Jesus. When I visited Moish not too long ago, he said, I know you're interested in Jewish evangelism. You came out of Brooklyn. Where else could you get so many Jews in one place? I said, right. He says, I have a button for you. He reached into his desk and pulled it out and stuck it on my lapel. Goy is for Jesus. You know what a Goy is? A Gentile. He said, I'm a Jew for Jesus. You're a Goy for Jesus. I said, that's right. And isn't it nice to know we're both spiritual Jews? He said, amen. The circumcision of the heart and not of the flesh. For your sake they are enemies concerning the gospel. But touching the election of God, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever.
Worship and praise and adoration and glory belong to Thee, our Father. Because of what You did for us by sending Your most precious possession that we might live through Him. O oh, Almighty God, breathe upon this congregation this morning. There may be those here, Lord, who have never been born again, who have never reached out their hand to the nail-pierced hand of the Master, who do not know the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Give them neither rest nor peace until they shall call out to Thee, Jesus, Savior, save me. That upon Thy children who love Thee and Thy appearing, that the comforting presence of Thy Holy Spirit and the hunger for Thy Word abide. May the Lord bless Thee and keep Thee. The Lord make His face to shine upon Thee and be gracious unto Thee. Yahweh Elohim lift up His countenance upon Thee and grant Thee peace now and for all eternity in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless. Same time next week. Members in prayer.